Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Cube uh, and welcome to the choreographic forum on the film that we just we have just seen, Ailey by Jamila Wigno, a documentary film about black dance pioneer Alvin Ailey. Um, so I don't know if you are familiar with the choreographic forum. Uh, this will be a lively um, discussion on the role of the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theatre Company in fostering participation and visibility of Black and African diaspora communities in the dance industry and its impact in the UK and its resonance with today's dance ecology in Bristol. So this forum has been organized by um, me, uh, Sinibaldo, um, for the Society for Dance uh, Research and the Cube, and uh, Merci Nabirie uh, for Kauma Arts. And uh, I will introduce Merci in a second. Uh, first, I um, just will say something about the forum. Uh, if you're not familiar with this format, it normally consists of a get together of researchers and practitioners to discuss a choreographic work which they watched independently ahead of the event. The forum is normally moderated by a chair and prompted by an initial response by up to two scholars with some expertise on teams brought up by the dance work. In this case, we are discussing a film and this is a, a, an, an innovation uh, for the format as this has been established by the Society for Dance Research. Um, so practitioners will be invited to offer a short response to the film lasting about five to ten minutes, either in words, in movement or both. Um, and after the, the discussion and the two panels that we are having today, there will be a refreshment um, for those who are participating in person. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to also introduce the Society for Dance Research, um, which is a, an organization for which I'm uh, working as um, events secretary at the moment. And um, it's uh, an UK organization for furthering dance studies and dance studies and practice. And uh, just something about myself. I am a researcher and artist interested in the role of body movement for people at the margins across multiple performance practices and ethnographic contexts. And actually, Ellie uh, and black dance is not my uh, main area of research. I'm quite new to this. Uh, but I wrote a PhD on uh, a staged adaptations of the Alevi Semas in contemporary Turkey and Europe. Uh, this was at the University of Exeter in uh, co-supervision with uh, Cardiff University. At the background, I am an anthropologist and uh, I'm also a movement notator. Uh, I'm currently studying to obtain an advanced diploma at the Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique et Danse de Paris in France. And, um, um, and I also, and I think this is uh, enough for me, and I also want to introduce Merci. Uh, um, and then I will hand it over to her. So Merci Nabirie uh, is a consultant and creative producer for Africa Dia Diaspora Arts and founding director of Kama Arts, which works with individuals and organizations to connect communities globally, rise profiles, the practice and awareness of diverse arts. She is a trustee on several boards globally. Her career portfolio includes Arts Council England, one Dance UK, ADAD, Royal Borough of Green, Greenwich Council, Birmingham Royal Ballet, Apples and Snakes. Mercy's artistic background is performing arts, dance, film, photography, and literature. In September 2021, she received an honorary doctorate of arts from University of East London in recognition of her achievements. 
And I also would like to add um, a note on how me and Mercy got together to organize this event. We first met last year while uh, organizing a symposium on inclusion and um, intersectionality, which was co-hosted by the Society for Dance Research, Coventry University, um, see there at Coventry University and um, Kanduko Dance Company. And uh, then I joined in uh, a Q&A that Mercy organized after the UK premiere of the film. Um, and uh, in this Q&A, uh, Mercy uh, um, called for everyone to promote the film and to um, uh, ask um, friends to watch it. And because I had been at the screening of the film in Bath, but I had, uh, um, I was said that the film was not presented in Bristol, I took up the call and I laced with the cube, uh, which is um, a cinema and community owned uh, performan uh, performance venue to um, organize a screening of the film. And the Cube has also supported us with uh, some uh, research council funding uh, to host this event. So uh, it's a big pleasure to welcome you all. And uh, I hope I said everything and I pass it on to Mercy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Baldo. It's exciting to be co-chairing this event with Baldo, Society for Dance Research in association with the Cube. I thank you Baldo for responding to the call to action at the brief encounter that Kalma Arts presented on the 6th of January to create a buzz around the film Ailey. And uh, just briefly, you know, I'm the director of Kalma Arts, which I set up after a stint as director for Dance of the African Diaspora. And uh, uh, as Baldo said, we work with individuals and organizations to provide platforms to connect communities, raise awareness and profiles of artists and art forms rooted in the African diaspora. We are international, intergenerational and intercultural and work across the art form. So that's basically about Kalma Arts. So now I'm going to introduce two speakers who will each present for about 10 to 15 minutes sharing their insights, responding to Ailey's choreography. Uh, a professor, choreographer, researcher, Thomas F. de France, direct slippage, performance culture. De France received the 2017 Outstanding Research in Dance Award from the Dance Studies Association and contributed concept and voiceover for a permanent installation on Black social dance at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. De France has taught at the American Dance Festival, Impulse Tans, Pondesora, and the New Waves Dance Institute, as well as at MIT Stanford, Yale, NYU, Hampshire College, Duke, Northwestern University, and the University of Nice. De France believes in our shared capacity to do better, and to engage our creative spirit for a collective good that is anti-racist, proto-feminist, and queer affirming. This is a recording, but Thomas hopes to join into the event later during the open discussion and Q&A as he couldn't attend earlier. Following Thomas uh, will be Dr. Adeshola Akinle, a choreographer and artist scholar. She's an assistant professor in the dance division at Texas Women's University. She's an affiliate researcher, MIT, Arts, Culture and Technology, and visiting artist at Center for Art, Science and Technology at MIT, and a theater Mundo, Mundi fellow, who began her career as a dancer with Dance Theater of Harlem Workshop Ensemble in USA, and later working in UK companies such as Green Candle and Carol Straker. Over the past 20 years, she has created dance works ranging from live performance 
that is often site specific and involves a cross section of the community to dance films, installations and texts. Her work is characterized by, by an interest in voicing people's lived experiences in places through creative moving portraiture. A key aspect of her process is the artistry of opening creative practices to everyone from ballerinas to architects to women in low wage employment to performance for young audiences. Her most recent, recent monograph is part of the Society for Dance Research in conversation series, Dance, Architecture and Engineering, Dance in Dialogue. Also to add to uh, the UK context, Adeshola edited Narratives in Black British Dance, an important publication to the UK dance landscape. Please feel free to prepare your questions either in person if you are at the Cube or in the chat room if you're on the Zoom. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes for a short Q&A before more presentations. We will start with Thomas's recording and then Adeshola will present live on Zoom. Welcome and over to you both. Hello, I am Thomas de France and I'm thrilled to be with you to offer some comments on the incredible life and career of choreographer Alvin Ailey. I am a professor of dance and African-American studies, now cited at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, the United States. And I was lucky enough to be a consultant on this project that was the documentary that you've just seen. Uh, Ailey's life is incredibly rich with a dramatic sort of, um, ins and outs and ups and downs. And I think the film does an amazing job at helping us understand the man behind the dances that mean so much for so many artists and audiences. Ailey was incredibly gifted at telling stories of black life and black love through choreography and embodied practice. I want to talk in my few minutes about how the choreography Ailey made had such an impact on the ways that we think of modern dance or contemporary performance now. Something that many people don't know about Ailey's career is that he really had very little time to develop himself as a choreographer. He maybe made one or two tiny little studies before his work was being offered up by professional dancers in front of professional critics. So Ailey really endured and enjoyed a bit a trial by fire where he was thrust into a, literally a national and then international spotlight as a leading choreographer very early in his career. So he definitely learned on the job. It's also interesting to notice that Ailey had a limited amount of dance training in his background. He really studied dance a bit here and there along the way, but he was such an incredibly gifted mover and he had such a belief in his own capacity to tell stories through dance that his work um, managed to make such an impact among artists, fellow artists, and audiences and of course critics throughout his lifetime. Ailey uh, began choreographing for the Lester Horton Company, which was uh, hinted at in the film. We learned a little bit about that. So he took over for Lester Horton as the lead choreographer for the company when Horton died very suddenly. And something else that's a little less known about Ailey's background as a professional artist is his interest and participation in classical ballet. So Ailey, as a young artist in the 1960s, uh, became a resident choreographer for the Rebecca Harkness Ballet. And this ballet company was based in New York City, but also managed to tour a bit internationally. So Ailey, who is someone who had studied modern dance here and there, and had a spectacular sort of presence on stage and had already made 
the incredible creation that is Revelations, um, was then employed as the lead artist for a ballet company that combined modern dance and ballet, uh, even as it made works that were very appealing to a general public throughout the 1960s. Another thing that was really interesting about the Harkness Ballet and Ailey's participation in it was that he was able to bring along several of his company members and fold them into the Harkness Ballet Company. So we have uh, people like the incredible Judith Jamison working as a leading dancer in a classical ballet company in the 1960s. And it's just an achievement and a, a sort of interesting trick of history that this is part of how Ailey continued to develop his choreographic eye and his choreographic sensibility was with dancers who were um, trained as classical ballet performers. Uh, Ailey also enjoyed uh, making uh, an incredible work for the American Ballet Theater in 1970. He was commissioned to make a new ballet for the company and uh, to his great delight, the musician and composer commissioned to make the work was none other than Duke Ellington. So Ailey was able to work with one of his own heroes, Duke Ellington, on a brand new piece of choreography with brand new music in their first uh, situation with a large American ballet company. And this work, The River, was uh, largely successful, according to the critics who didn't really have anything to compare it to, uh, because it was entirely unusual for two African-American artists to be the lead artists, the lead creative artists, on a ballet for that company at that time. Um, the work is incredibly varied and interesting and unexpected, and it allowed Ailey to combine the kind of interest in a, a weighty body, a body that knows how to refer to the earth and the ground that gives us life, and of course the water that also brings us such life and possibility, and in African diaspora cultures, we understand earth and water to be two of the, the cardinal elements that allow us to endure and to um, continue ourselves. Uh, and he was able to bring this kind of weighty and sinuousness that water also encourages into a work that also focused on ballet technique. And classical ballet tends to be reaching upward and quite ephemeral and not weighty at all and trying to lift towards um, the heavens, if you will. So Ailey in this work, The River, really worked to combine these entirely different methods of thinking about how a body could move and made a, a dance that's enduring. The River is still performed by ballet companies and sometimes by modern companies, including the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. Um, at, at certain times, they perform that work as well. If you ever get an opportunity to see it, I recommend it highly. It's unusual for lots of different reasons. It's one of the pieces, again, this was made in 1970, in which Ailey was able to address same-sex desire inside a large choreographic work. And so there's a really lovely, beautiful sequence at the center of the river called Lake, and in Lake, you have a kind of coupling ritual. And Ailey, in his way, was able to nod towards his own private life that we've learned so much about in the documentary, even in this public forum, where you have men dancing in a very loving and tender way with each other, women dancing in the same, but their own, loving and tender way amidst mixed sex couples so that we really see a kind of parade or a spectacle of, of life and love in a way that was really unusual, um, maybe not for the times, but definitely for a black artist working in a primarily white institution and setting. So Ailey was really already thinking about this aspect of his own life and his own you know, need to be closeted uh, because of the way that he wanted his company to succeed, um, but also finding ways to embed values and 
desires that were important to him to understand what it is to be human inside the creative work that he made. So the river holds a special place in my own heart as a dance historian and dance researcher because of these, these small kinds of encodings that are embedded in the work. And you do have to pay attention to understand how important they are to Ailey's vision and that they're actually there inside the work. Ailey was someone who worked in the Lester Horton technique, of course, which is a technique that um, um, allows us to think about a really long spine and sort of a really strengthy sort of legs. Like you, in the Horton technique, you're, you're really encouraged to um, work through the ground, but with a kind of attention to detail and precision. Horton technique is quite precise. Uh, Ailey also, though, was a very talented jazz dancer, and jazz might be a kind of propulsive moving that anticipates and responds to complex rhythms. And Ailey was an expert jazz dancer himself and would combine elements of jazz dance with elements of Horton technique and the kind of um, sort of uh, straightness and almost brittle body at times in Horton technique. And he would allow these, these ways of moving to, to bounce off of each other as he crafted his choreographic visions. Something else that I was always intrigued by in researching Ailey's choreographic career is how interested he was in lots of different kinds of music. So he would make a work that was to obviously Negro spirituals and African-American sacred music, but then he would make a work to the blues. Well, we might expect either of those for an artist in the 1950s and 1960s who wanted to share a message of black possibility with a general public that was largely made of white uh, audiences in the context of the United States. But then as the company toured, the many Asian audiences and Latinx audiences around the planet, as well as the indigenous audiences who also enjoyed seeing the company work in the ways that they did. But he would also, Ailey, would work with contemporary classical music, obviously with jazz music, as with Duke Ellington. He would work with pop music, as with the young singer-songwriter Laura Nero. He made an incredible suite of dances to Laura Nero's music that was called Quintet. And that piece is like a, a, a kind of parody or commentary on black women's girl groups. And so in this, in this piece that's set to Laura Nero's music, we see the kind of pathos and sadness behind the very public life that the women have to offer up to their audiences when they're on stage. This theme of a kind of private despair behind a public generosity uh, is something that runs through all of Ailey's choreography. So from early works in the 1960s to some of the last works that he made in the 1980s, we see this, this kind of lonely figure who has to respond to a large audience and is really um, kind of um, broken by this effort and how difficult it is to be a public figure. And I think that here is a place where Alvin Haley was uh, sharing about his life through his creative practice. So there are several ballets that we see that tell a story of a kind of public glamour and willingness to be photographed and in the public eye, but then a really private despair that kind of encircles and follows the leading artist. And I do think that this theme uh, is something that was real to Ailey's life, as we've learned from the documentary, but it's also an important theme to think about in relationship to his achievement. He managed to transform the ways that we understand Black expressive culture to operate. And he managed to create opportunities for legions of Black dancers from all over our extravagant diaspora. Dancers, obviously, from the UK 
and from South Africa and other parts of the continent, as well as dancers from Latin America, indigenous dancers from the United States. And it's important to know white dancers, so Euro-American or European from other parts of the world. The Ely Company always had people who presented themselves as white inside the company. It was important to Alvin Ailey as he thought about a world we might share. And in that world, black life and black love are in the front and the center of how we operate. And there's room. There's room for those of us who are queer. There's room for those of us who are white. There's room for us who don't know much about dance, but understand what it is to feel moved. And if anything, Ailey was an artist of movement and the creative craft of helping us be moved. I'm so glad to share these tiny comments with you and I'm sure you enjoyed the documentary. There's so much more to learn about Alvin Ailey's achievement, but I also just encourage us all to support live performance and especially Black dance. Black dance continues to provide a barometer of where we've been, where we are, and where we think we might go. So I'm a fan and I'm really glad to share these comments with you. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, um, I, I'll just, before Adeshola speaks, I'll just pull out a few small phrases that Thomas did say uh, in his um, presentation, which is amazing. Um, he spoke about the man behind the art, telling stories through black dance and black love. Um, the different techniques, he took us through the different techniques that he went through and the different forms. Of course, he was co consulting on the uh, project, so he did have an insight in that and it was all well put together. And then he mentioned Ailey as an artist of movement, um, a craft that helps us to be moved. And also um, the movement that reveals the meaning of things as well. So it's really interesting that he says that. And, and at the end, he says a call to action as well to support um, live performances, especially black dance, because that is the barometer of where we have been, where we are and where we think we might go. I'll end there. And I think um, that would be really interesting. So over to you, Adeshola, thank you. Hi. Um, thank you. I'm really um, excited to be speaking. Um, I'm going to be making a comment on how the film um, offers a, co a commentary uh, beyond the United States, um, particularly in the UK. Um, and part of that is because of the book um, that Nurse uh, Mercy mentioned, that I had the privilege to um, edit and curate this book, Narratives in Black British Dance, which has 17 chapters from a range of different um, people that identify with the idea of blackness, dance, and being and Britishness, um, and so from doing that um, work to edit the book, there were always some uh, streams going through the book that seemed to be reoccurring um, in different people's chapters, although they're very different approaches and different lives that the different artists have had, um, and one of them was the influence of. Um, Alvin Ailey and particularly when the company came, uh, the times that the company had come to England to perform and uh, the impact that that had on British dancers. Um, there's a Namron, there's a chapter by Namron at the beginning of the, the book and he says um, that he'd see, he went to see the Martha Graham company and um, there were black and white dancers standing holding spears and that was enough to encourage me, he says. Um, six months later, I attended a performance by, by Alvin Ailey and my whole world fell apart. And I think it's that, um, that idea that um, suddenly um, there, uh, by there seemed to be possibility. So what I wanted to do um, in my little 
bit of time was talk about th uh, three um, sort of thoughts, really. Um, the first one is this idea of possibility um, and how much uh, Alvin Ailey and the company and the choreography um, offered to, I'm going to be speaking about British dancers, not because I feel like I represent British dancers, but because I'm a British dancer. So obviously the story is different for different people. Um, but um, I, I feel like one of the things was that it offered British a British dancer the idea that there was a possibility of um, being a possibility of black dance and a possibility of um, being a dancer at times when there wasn't um, necessarily the same um, ability to see British dancers uh, receive um, the same sort of uh, place for their for their choreographic work. And so not to say that there aren't there weren't black British choreographers uh, working at the time, but that um, Alvin Ailey's work and um, allowed us to sort of see that in the in the in the global space of his of him being sort of accepted through um, international tours and so forth. Um, so that how important that is that um, that the, the the sort of the crack the cracking of the shell is is the idea of possibility, that it's possible to do something. And then the, the second um, thought that I had was around the idea of imagination. And I guess I'm talking directly about um, some of the, you know, like a, a large part of this, the idea of black dance is also about dealing with racism and how uh, black dance hasn't necessarily had the support um, that anything that's not called black dance has had. So not to say that black dance is a thing um, or that it had black people haven't um, influenced mainstream dance, but just the idea of black dance hasn't necessarily received the same sort of support or funding um, as something that's non-black dance. Um, so uh, possibility is the first idea. And then the second idea is imagination. And I just wanted to unpack uh, how maybe looking at imagination as not being the best thing, that, that um, we can only <coughs> if we only envision as far as we can imagine, that's a very limiting space, right? You know, in a way, what we want to do is be exposed to something beyond our imagination. Like when you see something really beautiful, you think to yourself, I could never have imagined that. And um, so what I feel like uh, um, Mr. A, Ailey's work did was extend people's imagination for what black dance could be on the stage. So that um, it pushed the edges uh, for people to, um, to extend, extend their ability to imagine what, what a black dancer would look like and what black choreography looks like um, in, a, in the Western contexts of, um, of Britain. Um, and that sort of, uh, uh, as Dr. De France just said, it, the sort of uh, extending the imagination for what uh, black expressive culture means um, so that we can try to, uh, as we're working, you know, um, and thinking about what choreography is and assessing each other's choreography and supporting choreography, uh, that possibly there's a, there's a space to argue that we want to look for the things that we couldn't have imagined rather than um, what we imagine <coughs> for people. And I think that sometimes uh, black choreographers in Britain have been um, asked to produce what people can imagine. Like, oh, we imagined this work and we'd love you to produce something that's similar to that. Um, and actually what the space that is needed is for allowing choreographers to create things that, you, that are unimaginable, that mm. are new um, uh, to how we imagine uh, what a piece of dancing would look like. Which brings me to the last point, which is this idea of example. Um, and Dr. De France kind of uh, touches on this a little bit as well when he says that um, uh, Mr. Ailey uh, had a, tri a trial by fire in that his work was quite quickly put into, into the sort of light of, of, of the critiques and so forth. Um, and that is that as for choreographers, 
um, to move from being an example, like being an example of a black choreographer to having an artistic process. Um, and, and that often um, people's work is, is presented as an example of what black dance could be or um, of, a, of a black choreographer, um, with, which doesn't allow for the luck, what could ends up being a luxury um, of having an artistic process, of having moments when things don't work and when they do work, um, when you go down certain avenues and then you come back another way in, in, the, in the artistic process of what you're doing. Um, so through the, through the three steps, the, the possibility that this could happen, the, the allowing people to move beyond the imagination, beyond what's the uh, sort of imagined for, for dance, and then allowing that person to be more than just an example of something, but to actually be in their own artistic process. And, and that takes um, a community, a community that is the dance community, um, supporting the choreographer through a process and knowing that it's that they're not making work that is an example of what this should be, but they are making work that is part of a body of work that is their artistic process. Um, so for me watching the, the documentary, um, those three words kind of, uh, those three ideas kind of rang out as, as you sort of follow Mr. Ailey's uh, career and also think about how uh, the impact that it has beyond the United States in, in um, say the UK. And, I, and I, I'm talking about beyond the United States because um, there are a, a lot of the work is specific to the black, ex, the African American experience, um, and the Black British experience is going to be different, and the um, Nigerian experience and the Caribbean experience are um, these are all different experiences. So um, this pro, it would be wonderful if this process uh, was global. Um, I hope that makes sense, that, that, that there's sort of lessons to be learned from um, what happens when you uh, give energy and power and, uh, to uh, an amazing artist is that that then can um, feed uh, the whole community of artists beyond, beyond their experience into the global um, community of what it means to explore dance as a choreographer. Yes, um, thank you very much, Adeshala. That was um, really interesting. And uh, it, it's, um, you know, I hope everybody got um, the concept in terms of the idea of possibility, the idea of imagination, and the idea of example. Isn't that right? Yeah, the three things. So that's really well put. And I feel that um, it's actually quite interesting when I think about the different choreographies and the different things that came to mind when I was listening to or when I was watching the 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 the, the screening which is interesting so I have um, is there anyone uh with a question that we can pose just briefly before we get on to um I think it's going to be a break before before we go on to the second part um but I think it would, it would be nice to kind of bring up some of the, the observations and questions. I see here there was, um, uh, Jane was saying, it was interesting to hear about the duets in River. So that's, um, that's uh, one of, one of uh, the, the ones I want to watch actually. I want to watch again and kind of think more. And um, uh, so Adeshola, well, Jane is saying as well that, uh, thanks Adeshola, good to think how we support um prov you know process so it would be nice to kind of think about that i have a question for you adishola actually um maybe i could start while the others um think about one of them um one of think about questions that they could pose and also as we wait for um thomas to come in i think he's going to join us later so right my question uh, let me see where I, 
I kind of wrote it somewhere, so, okay. I've watched some of your choreography at the show and I love it actually. So when I see how these dancers have embodied a history of a people, for instance, Revelations, I can also see the I am resonating through the dance pieces. Do you want to share how you embody stories through your work and how you relate to this through your practice? Just briefly, because um, yeah, we have we, we have a break. Yeah, and I thank you so much for asking about uh, my practice when we're talking about so many amazing people. It sort of feels a bit uh, weird, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, and and um, I guess that I'm one of the things that I think is really important about uh, from in, that I try and do in my practice is um, create work within the community uh, that I'm hoping will come and see the work. Um, and I, I guess that that sort of uh, resonates with what we've been looking at and so forth um, in that um, making work about your own experience, mm -hmm. um, I think is really important in terms of situating it within your own community, even if your own community isn't the mainstream. And um, often people, I know people uh get responses say to funding and things like that where it says you know we're not sure if you've got the demographic for this um which uh can can mean that you all, almost take your work your work is being asked to be dislocated from mm. where the meaning of it or the the um the sort of sense making of it or the felt of it is uh, is where that base is uh, i think uh, um you know it's, I, I share this with other choreographers, I think, how important it is um, to locate your work in the, in the communities that, that resonate with you, that you're speaking about and that you're using and, um, and the movement, the, the movement that comes from that community, that that being valid, that there isn't a kind of um, codified main kind of dance and then something else that you kind of uh, maybe pick at, but rather, the, the sort of the meaning of, of your movement comes from the, the, the movement that comes from the community that you're, you're basing your work in. Um, and that, that I, the idea that um, you, you have to work towards a particular demographic or that your demographic isn't big enough or, or any of that, it, we can see how that comes later. You make, the, you make your, the work as authentically as possible. And I think then you, people that can be surprised by how that can touch people beyond the original community that you maybe identify with and um, out, out into other communities and sort of the wider, more universal voice. Um, because we're, we're all human and um, we, share, we, share, we share some um, elements of what it means to be a human when we dance that touches across uh, lots of uh, lived experiences. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, I know that you do some work for the museums and the young people. And Sally here says, thanks at the show. I can see how the pro uh, process thread could apply to dance in museums. So I'll let Baldo um, ask some questions in the um, audience or take over with your uh, uh, section. Okay. Um, I will just, uh, uh, because people are not aware of the chat going on on Zoom, of course, uh, so I just wanted to check if there are questions from the auditorium. And um, yeah, there is a question. Hello, Alex. Should I, should we use a microphone for, okay. And actually, I will also turn the camera around. I just uh, watching the, uh, the movie. Um, I just felt that A seemed to just become inspired by whatever he was inspired by at the time. Choreograph it, and that was that was his thing. Um, it it didn't seem. I mean, obviously his background and he's had all sorts of influences, and he was fascinated by all that stuff. Of course, everything. Um, and that just combined, I mean, you could see elements of braille, ballet, and probably the Horton technique, which I know nothing about, but uh, um, 
Yeah, I, I just, I think that's what we have to do. We have to have inspiration in our photograph or inspiration in paper picture or whatever it is, you know. Um, yes, of course. <laughs> I wonder if, uh, if uh, Adesola, you want to respond to that, or, or uh, uh, if that was more a comment than a question. Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if anybody wants to add something. Uh, can you repeat what was said? It was a bit quiet. So if I repeat it, I, I think you are saying that what was very quiet how uh, Eric was getting inspiration from his own uh, living environment and uh, photograph. And this is what we really have to do in terms of uh, uh, creative work, to get inspiration from anything. Should I use the microphone if I'm here? Sorry. Did you get it from there? Or should I repeat again? You got it? Yeah, it's it just um, the, the process. I did see a process. I just saw inspiration and execution. Um, of course, it was influenced by his background. Of course, it was. And continuing experience, I'm quite sure, in life as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, talking myself. Just, uh, you know, I, I, was, um, I used to be a classical ballet dancer, and now I'm a contemporary dancer. But... Um, Yes, so I'm, I'm talking from a little bit of experience and having worked with, you know, some of the greatest choreographers in, in the world as well. So um, I'm just what my comment is valid, I hope. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I wonder, I wonder if uh, Adesola, you want to, I think there is something about this idea of process, creative process, and uh, as opposed to <laughs> Being an example, I, I suppose, if it's something that touches with on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really not the most qualified to talk directly about uh, Alvin Ailey in terms of uh, his life. Um, there, I would say that I think part of the, you know, the point of the film and and a lot of what Dr. De France was saying is that um, even with with it. You know the film's only an hour and a half so i don't think you could necessarily unpick the artistic process as well in the film but uh the different works that um what mr ailey made also show process and and show sort of artistic process as well um i think part of what i was saying um in a sense is that idea that you know how do we move from seeing something as an example of something really good to seeing it as part of an artistic process because the the danger of that is a little bit a sort of uh um you know like i want to say a monkey on a barrel kind of thing where you're like okay this is really good can you make another one like that um, and which stifles uh, choreographers so that they aren't in artistic process. So, um, and also I think that it's quite um, useful to think about um, the, the, the sort of lived experience of different people um, might mean that as they're working through um, a process, you might not recognize what that process is because your lived experience is different. For instance, um, Rennie Harris's work is just amazing work um, and he's drawing on all this different um, dance forms and as you're watching you can see he's drawing on you know a, a step from here and um, a dance form from there and putting that together to make this some um, really expressive work that speaks to the culture as well that you know like some of these movements have kind of real cultural uh, meaning to specific groups of people if you were standing outside of that, you might not uh, be able to unpick the process of, of how those steps came together. It might just look like, oh, the, there are a whole load of steps there that, that, um, that look really nice together. But they also have kind of cultural significance. So sometimes um, in, in different communities, 
um, there are sort of movement significances that if you're outside of that community, you don't see. Um, but I think trusting the process and trusting the artists with their own process, that that's a great gift to, to give a choreographer. Thank you. I think, Mercy, what, what do you, should we close this part and uh, have a, a little break before we join again to focus on Bristol? And now you're muted. Sorry, yes, we need to focus on Bristol, but thank you very much, Atishola. Um, I don't think um, uh, Thomas is in the room as yet. Uh, I also had a question for him, actually, it was to do with how he relates to, you know, telling stories through Black dance, um, Black joy, and, you know, all of that. Um, but also, um, I like uh, what Rennie Harris said at the beginning when he said, um, how do you make a choreography for a 60 year old legacy? And then he said, it's memory. And so it's that memory that you pull from the lived experience that actually gets you going. And then you start thinking and remembering. And so that was really resonating uh, on so many at so many levels actually. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, let's um, hear from, have a break and then hear again from the Bristol experience. So bringing it down to the ground, thank you. Thank you Adeshola. We know that you, you are uh, catching a fly soon. You are between on a fly stop. <laughs> so there is a chance that you may join again later. But uh, for now, we say thank you so much for joining us. It's great that you made it. Yes. And, uh, and I think we can gather again in uh, uh, 10 minutes to hear about uh, Bristol. And um, there is also a refreshment for uh, people in the auditorium. But we keep this for, uh, for uh, later. For later, yeah. There's somebody who actually mentioned, uh, is it Sally, who said looking at as a pro looking at this as a process just helps some brains to understand makes it easier to share good practice if you don't have the luxury of time money maybe part of Ailey's gift yeah so I'll end with that and over to you Baldo thank you thank you so stretch your legs do your moves <laughs> five, minutes, five to ten minutes and we are back We are here, great. I don't see you. I uh, also people on Zoom. Happy to, uh, to see your faces if you feel like, so that we we know we can see you. Um, okay. So we go on with this second session. Uh, we wanted to um, just uh, bring the attention and the spotlight a bit on uh, Bristol and what is going on in Bristol. And before I introduce my guests, I want to just relate about what, uh, why, how this uh, event came, uh, came about and uh, what's my interest in, uh, what has been my experience of uh, um, approaching revelations. Uh, so this uh, Q&A, I mean, this forum uh, started after I joined the Q&A that Mercy organized for the UK release of the film a month ago. And um, I went to see the film in Bath because there was no screening in, in Bristol. And uh, in the cinema, there were like five people. And I thought that it would be a good, uh, it was a bit uh, uh, a pity that uh, uh, it wasn't coming to Bristol. And um, because I thought there would be more viewers here more a bigger audience and then with the uh, with the q a that uh, mercy organized with kauma arts um and their call for action really motivated me to get in touch with the cube where i'm a volunteer and ask if we could set up a screening in the space and this happened because rodri uh uh, also, I mean, what is interesting that uh, Rodri also got an email at the same time from um, somebody wanted to come to the cube and watch it because this uh, space is also a community owned cinema and people can make it uh, can make what they want out of it. 
So I kind of managed to bridge Society for Dance Research with the Cube Microplex and the uh, Kauma Arts, and uh, we are here. And my interest in, uh, in, in Revelation started, uh, I mean, I, I knew a bit about Ali, Alvinelli, and uh, I, I liked it, but uh, until one year ago, I was very, very distant from that, until uh, in my course uh, in movement notation in France, we uh, worked on revelations for a, a reconstruction. So we divided the piece uh, among uh, uh, me and my colleagues in my course, and each of us got an extract. And uh, we, we, we decoded the notation that I have there, if anybody wants to see how that looks like. And, um, and then we taught this uh, extract to a dancer in the conservatoire in Paris. And in, uh, I mean, with a lot of work on the side of the notator, but uh, finally with the morning of work for the, uh, an hour of work for the dancers, we could recreate the piece, not all of it, but extracts. And it was a great um, experiment. But uh, I think what is very, what is kind of uh, to my heart is that this is, uh, uh, for me, this was happening in Bristol, although I was isolating and uh, I was in the living room, there is my flatmates here. And, um, but I think there is something about Bristol and dance and uh, um, black dance in Bristol that is very interesting to, to speak about or uh, to learn more about. And at the moment, I'm participating in this project that uh, Cleo Lake, is, uh, who is here with me, is co-organizing, uh, co-chairing with uh, Quasi Johnson and Jessica Moody. I think she will say more about that. And then with the connection that also Mercy had, we tried to look for, uh, for um, other people who would be interested in joining a, in a conversation. And uh, um, Mercy, uh, reached out to Rachel that I didn't know, but actually we danced together before we met each other. <laughs> we found out earlier because there is a picture of us uh, dancing. Um, and uh, there were many more people that we invited, but uh, who couldn't make it at the end. One of them is Deborah Badu, who was not feeling well. And uh, Leticia uh, Cesar also had the last minute uh, uh, issue and she sadly cannot be with us. And then there is uh, Ruba who also we reached out and he, he couldn't commit, but finally is with us on the call. Mm. So maybe he can uh, say hello if he wants later. And there is another person that we got in touch with, which is uh, Batch, uh, I don't know if I pronounced the surname Gay. right. Gay, uh, who also couldn't make it, but we just wanted to mention all those names uh, to, to kind of um, share information and um, see, um, I mean, we are hoping that more things came up, will come up, come up out of this. Now, this is just uh, what, uh, like my brief uh, introduction. Now, I will leave the, the, the word to Rachel, I think, for her to share her uh, comments or reflections. And I think I will turn the, the camera like that. But before doing that, I will introduce you. And I have, a, I have a, your bio. So Rachel de Garang has been a dance practitioner for many years, as well as producing and programming for festivals, a researcher and writer with a keen interest in the music and dance of Brazil. She traveled to Salvador Bahia, where she trained in the Silvestri Technique, Orisha Symbology and Dance Movement. This underpinned her continuing research into ancestral memories in the creative process. She founded and manages African Sambistas, a drum and dance group, and is a founding member of Black Women Let Loose Theater Company, which is enabling her to hone her creative writing, storytelling, and performance skills. Her day job is working for a mainstream arts, uh, arts development agency. So I leave it to you. 
I don't know if uh, it's too, maybe we can swap seats. I think it would be best. Thank you. It's kind of weird. I've never done a hybrid um, we never presentation. No, no. So I want to talk to the people in the room. I also want to talk to the people on screen. So I will do my best. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mercy, for inviting me. It was really exciting. I have come across Albert Ailey's work, Watching Revelations, which blew me away the first time I saw it. Um, the movements are unique, but they're not. He's taken um, influences from Africa. I, I recognize some Senegalese dance movements, some Saba, some Djembe, um, some Orisha movement as well. So for me, it was completely like my heart went with it. So when I watched the film, it resonated with me in a number of ways. I was brought up in the church. Uh, my beloved father was a preacher. He was not just a preacher. He was a political activist who spoke up not only for the rights of people to worship their God in the way that they wished, if they wanted to dance, if they wanted to sing, he believed in that. But he also believed in people's rights to maintain their property and not be exploited. That didn't go down well with the government of the day. And it didn't go down well for my father. But that's another chapter. Another time, I'll share that story with you. There was a time in my life when I seriously considered joining a religious order, becoming a nun, no less. But my destiny and service was somewhere else where I had been blessed with many gifts. This destiny also included the rediscovery of my love for music and dance. I believe that once a dancer, always a dancer. But now in this moment, when I'm not dancing, I look back and see pictures of myself dancing. It is as if it was somebody else. Who is that dancer? Is that really me? Is she? really me or maybe it was just a dream but maybe indeed a memory deep inside of me in which case is she still in me i dance in my dreams i dream that i'm dancing and when i wake i can still hear the music i can feel the dance deep inside of me on the surface of my skin but most of all in my heart. I do remember what it feels like to dance. When I dance, I fly high, light as air, but still connected to the earth beneath my feet. When I dance, I'm transported to another dimension. Where do I go? Where is this wonderful place? a place I sure want to return to now again and again. Now, when I watch Alvin Ailey and his dancers, my heart leaps. I'm transfixed and transformed to another dimension, a place I know I have been before. So I watch them again and again. I rejoice because I have not forgotten the dance and how it feels the dance must therefore still be in me. I pray that the dance has not forgotten me and that I am still in the dance because I feel the dance is still in me because I believe once a dancer, always a dancer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's walk. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I just uh, come in the center to introduce Cleo. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. And now I'll introduce Cleo. Is your bio? I love. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Bristol born artist, activist, and politician, Cleo Lake has established a reputation as a strong social justice activist and campaigner, particularly regarding anti austerity and issues affecting African heritage communities. Cleo is the former Lord Mayor of Bristol. 2018-2019 and was elected as a councillor for Cotham between 2016 and 2021, then serving as Deputy Green Group Leader, MIP, uh, MEP, uh, do I say it right? Yeah. Candidate. Yeah. Candidate. Green Party National Deputy Leader Candidate. This is the boring stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> and more recently candidate for police and crime commissioner for Avon and Somerset. Involved within the arts and culture sector for almost two decades, uh, Leo's experience includes being chair of Sample Carnival, radio producer and presenter on Ujima Radio, Adat Trailblazer, uh, writer and in residence at the Arnold Feeney and Bristol and Bath Creative uh, R&D Inclusion Fellow. She is currently an actress with Shiba Soul Ensemble, director of international arts organization uh, Black Artists on the Move, a dance therapist leading a weekly elderly elders exercise class, and is a research associate at Bristol University on the UKRI funded Decolonizing Memory Digital Bodies in Movement project. So I leave it to you, Cleo. Thank you Thank very you. much. Evening, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Cindy Baldo, have I said it right? <laughs> yeah. um, great name. And yeah, really good to meet you. I think we met first online for the Bristol we, Takes We met at the... uh, Licata once. Oh, did yeah. we? Okay. Yeah. Well, we've got to know each other more over the... <laughs> no, <laughs> over... but it's true. We first met uh, also in the protest. Yeah, the, the day the statue protest. was That's done. right. Yeah. Good. So yeah, great to be here. I've, I finished watching the film today. Brilliant film quite emotional. Um, you can't really separate being a dancer from emotion. I hope that's obvious. So I watched the film and I just kind of jotted down some thoughts really. I think we saw in the film aspects of Ailey where he kind of was a stream of con you know, unconsciousness, if you like, just creating on the moment um, and just allowing whatever came to come out. And we do that sometimes as writers as well. Um, I also try to tie in and reflect some of my thoughts about Bristol and some of the key points along my journey that, have, that, have, that seem important to me. Um, so brackets, no subject. Fingers that bled to pick cotton, back bent, broken. Internalized memories of this deja vu out in I am identity, masked as theater transcendence, stretched out and sidelined through a point, a pose, a poise, a pause from pain. Those fingers that picked cotton, never part of the bigger picture of prosperity or privilege, shut out, shut down, less than, below, beneath, but still you rise out of and beyond any box that might pin down your progress or ideas. Steps are drilled for the 60th, popping shoulders and recycled jazz traceable at least to the 1930s. The breath out, the rhythm, the accent. Echo me, Ajido, Irie, Perry Lewis of Jazzcotech, a St. Paul Sports Center, Pax Productions and Imani, Circus Baobab at the opening of Circo Media, Akuma Pa, Pinal Guerrier and Creo Bode, Sheba Montserrat, Angie Amra Anderson, Norman Rubber Stevenson, Batch Gay, Alain Hernandez, Letitia Caesar, Hype Dance, Fresh Dance, Bristol Fusion Dance, Tolo Cotolo, and other iterations. The Trinity Center, the Kumba Center, the Dance Center, for the floor technicians is Saeed and Issa Suane on a four hour epic. 
intermittent masterclasses and the Big Mission 2006 brackets in Birmingham. Add add trailblazers, markers. That's in Bristol. Let's get it sorted. Sort it. A dance for freedom and possibilities. A protest on stage. Fingers that bled to pick cotton. Suppressed memories manifest through the physical historians that house libraries and continuums and stretch from the elbow through to the index finger. Fingers that bled to pick cotton. Unwanted memories manifest. Blood memories, but what of the movement that came before? Decolonize the memory. There is no shame in going back to get what you forgot or what you lost or loathed to recall because it was unsafe to do so. Eurocentric endorsements and beating them at their own game. Revelations, reach up, reach out, relive, reliving. Composure, compassion, carried by melody. Muted tones, cut and cut space. Heart space centers and anticipates next steps on a life stage and cycle that can't be choreographed. Fingers didn't always bleed. Memory might stretch and point past this, touching the earth, the water, the elbow bends, the back thrusts. A badger, a badger, a badger. Take us back to our dances that could conjure tight communities, call spirits, control the weather, and change lives. The purpose of dance is. Thank you. <laughs> That was great. I don't have um, much words, really. Um, I see everybody clapping. So um, yeah, I think we can uh, uh, keep it going, like uh, open up floor to anyone to contribute, uh, either uh, comments, questions, either in the audience, either online. And um, I also wonder if uh, uh, Ruba, who is in the call, if he wants to say something uh, at this time, or also Mercy, if you if you are if you want to to contribute as well. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I thank you so much, Rachel and Cleo. That was fantastic, poetic meaningful and to the point in terms of um, your different insights onto the choreography. Uh, it was very relevant, it's still relevant and it's amazing, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad to have, to, to have known you or to know you both actually. Cleo, you mentioned trailblazers and Cleo is an Adad trailblazer. And uh, that's when I met, met her. Rachel was also, um, uh, involved in the Adad movement and uh, I think it was around about the the time that we were doing the exhibition the black dance exhibition and uh, you were quite instrumental in that as well so uh, yeah so it's really good to know and to to see that things are still moving and you're still um, you know kind of like holding the torch for black dance and uh, it's quite relevant. So thank you so much for that. I just wanted to say that. And also I'll leave probably Robert to say something because um, this is Bristol based. Oh, you lies. <coughs> <laughs> oh, I was trying to keep quiet. Yeah. Um, start video. Okay. 
Uh, welcome everyone. Yes, um, I first of all admit I was not going to make this meeting because I was occupied. So obviously I missed the um, Alvin Haley film and I've been hearing some points in between cooking. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, hearing some points, yeah. Um, and I've always admired Alvin Haley, his work, but when I can get to see it, yes. And I respect their work that they do highly because it is profiled black dance, yeah, at a higher level. But for, uh, me, I'm, I'm gonna put a spanner in the works, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the poem that Cleo just read really resonated with me and how I feel about my art form, traditional African dance. Uh, I've been now doing this now for 45 years. Can you see me? <laughs> yeah, I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, for 45 years, I've been involved in this art form. And something happened to me um, when I had, a, um, I'll say, a weekend uh, activity with other dance forms, contemporary ballet, and we were all in one complex teaching our different forms. And during a break, um, I overcome or was told that African dance haven't got no technique. And that really knocked me because it was true. There was no kind of like books like you get in contemporary dance, ballet, no, you know, techniques. And I spent the last, ooh, so many years now trying to, um, or, okay, creating that technique, tell the truth, yes. Um, which I kind of like say in my position, uh, hold back on, yes. And that's due to the fact that um, to be in a, 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 a circle of people, of, 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 of um, people who are of high standings in the dance community, I don't feel I'm really in that. And the reason being is that I've been really been a lot of great works, obviously, yes. And I still don't fully know everything about him before I say what I'm going to say. Uh, but for me, traditional African dance has kind of been left out of the pile, yes. Um, a lot of dancers up and down the country, around the world, draw their influence from African dance, creating new dance form from the traditional aspects of the dances and their creativity, and they change it and they bring new light. But um, one thing I've always felt is that the source is kind of ignored. And I'm not a politician or that person to kind of like make that change. Maybe we can do it collectively. But first we have to gain that interest there are particular skills and technique in African dance that is absolutely uh, out of this world. And because the dance form itself is not being created for performance, yeah, it's been created to explain the lives of community, of people, of individuals, of, of countries, etc. So it's that it's a living organism, something like that, I would say. And for me, I think that's a very vital part of the human makeup to kind of like, how do you say, to experience, yes. And it can bring a lot of changes and it can break a lot of barriers, yeah, uh, amongst the dance fraternities up and down the country or around the world. So I was wondering if um, Alvin Haley's work has kind of like reached out to the world. You see what I mean? But and he drew from traditional African dance. I I I heard a word mentioned earlier on about exploitation. Yeah, and to me, um, I think that to to draw from this art form and to create new pieces, yeah, 
um, one has to, the art form, the traditional dance has to be in, in line with, 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 with everything else. I'm talking from personal experience because, you know, uh, to be honest, it feels like a poor man art form. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it cannot mix with the other elites, yes. And the other elites are not particularly interested or are not aware of the beauty of this dance and how it can really, I uh, say, transform even more, yeah, people and communities. Um, and the art form is kind of dying out, I would say, because in Ghana, there used to be uh, institutes where you can go and learn these traditional dances. And some of these institutes are now doing African contemporary dances and pursuing that. And a lot of young people are not so interested no more in the rules, in the city areas and so forth. All across Africa you can notice these changes. And for me, um, we done um, digital memory yesterday with Cleo. And they were take, using different dance forms, including African dance, Caribbean dance, to create this digital memory around our transatlantic slave trade. And I remember in a discussion saying, as long as you keep the essence, yeah, 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 and give kudos to the traditional dance forms, uh, people tend to claim, but don't give, um, um, how do you say, kudos. So that's a point that, um, yeah, um, I feel a little bit uh, concerned about, let me put it this way. And it'd be great to hear what other people might say about this or think about it or might want to know. Um, so I don't know if I've kind of like come offline with the conversation today, because I say I was being in and out, I admit that. Yes, um, and, and wasn't going to make it. But I hope you understand my concern because there's only a few of us left in this country who can pass on this art form. There's only a few of us, very few of us, and a handful probably, yes. And I spent my years training dancers in an underground fashion, I call it, <laughs> yeah, to achieve their dreams of continuing to keep this art form alive. And I've got artists who now mix it with uh, contemporary dance, they mix it with Afrofusion. And, you know, being that we used to run the DMAX studios, if um, as some of you are not familiar with that, that was the studio we had in Bristol here for over 12 years. And we had every art form inside there, ballet, yeah, alongside contemporary, alongside African dance. It was a really beautiful community, yeah. And I felt this was maybe a chance to kind of like bring bring more kudos <laughs> to African dance. Unfortunately, due to, um, as I say, the, the complex nature of surviving as a company, yeah, yeah, um, that studio's closed. And we're still carrying on. We're still doing what we can to bring this to light. So that's my concern. I mean, it's about how an alien talking really is, you know, kind of like what did he do for the traditional dances that he drew those movements from? And why is it that we just don't seem to be um, equally equally recognized or, or what? And now there's several answers for this, yes? And people can blame, say, black people don't this or something like that. But I think it's, 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 and it's and, and it's a two-way thing because yeah, yeah, traditional dances um, from Africa, it's very rare you see kind of like books and 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 and, and man, manuals and, and training colleges and 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 and, and venues to, to 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 bring it forward. So my cry really is that we need to focus on making this more accessible so that we can keep this very important art form alive. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruba. I, I wonder if any, if uh, Rachel or Cleo uh, want to take that up or um, if we have more, anybody wants to add to, to that. And uh, I'm juggling between many things. Um, I think as dance artists, and actually both of us studied dance at Bath Spa University, mm -hmm. um, I was just reflecting on that and, and coming from more of an underground sort of dance background, more DIY, you know, attending the odd masterclass here and here and there. But to go to Bath Spa and, and straight, I mean, it, it's great. It ex expanded my thinking, collaborating with different artists and different ways of um, looking at dance, if you like, and being a creative. That was that was good. But, you know, to be told, well, we're not dancing to the beat and other kind of things. It was very, very difficult to fit into that environment. And I think, you know, going through a dance career, if you're kind of working in the community and if you're rooted in your community and if that's a big part of who you are and what's important to you, it always felt kind of, um, well, you're a dance artist, but you're not quite a proper dance artist. You know, you're not doing the ballet or this or that or the other. So I think it, it feels like a sort of sense of snobbery. And, it, you know, I'm sure much of this what Robert described doesn't come as a big surprise to a lot of us. Um, and I think also dance from many different cultures, including, you know, cultures that have long been here, um, established in the British Isles, um, Celtic or whatever else, you know, there's always been that tradition of bringing people together through dance. So I think for me, generally, um, I see dance as such an important function. And I feel that that's, that's generally been marginalized anyway. I think we have some of the music might remain, but the dance doesn't seem to be as integral. So I've always been keen to, whether it's through dance of the African diaspora or traditional African dance, Caribbean dance, to the sense of folk dance and, and that aspect of, of it bringing community together, really. Absolutely. And this is uh, very much also the, the spirit of this event, I think. Like we are having a, it's like an excuse to get together and uh, know each other, meet each other. And uh, I think what you say is also very much true for people who are maybe for all the reasons, not in that uh, canon of uh, what is dance supposed to be or what is a dancer supposed to be. I feel myself very much in not fitting, but still I do. And uh, so it's something that goes beyond the, really the, the the ethnicity or mm. the race element and uh, I mean it's a kind of something that should really help us reconsider a lot of assumptions we have on what dance is what does it do did you want to add something Rachel just just well I mean you know Cleo said it everyone said it but for me when I came to Bristol it's when I rediscovered dance Bristol was a place where I found myself as a dancer again I'd lost, I'd lost my way in dance because, well, uh, Cleo mentioned a lot of the venues, a lot of the dance companies. I used to go to rubbers classes. Dance, dancers would come from London to Bristol. I used to travel up to London every month, every two months, because you know, it costs money, um, to do master classes with Peter Badijo and amazing. You know, I just, I, I couldn't, my life would be different if it wasn't for the dance. Um, dance saved me, you know, it's a kind of classic thing people say dance. And for me, traditional African dance is where it's at for me. Um, it's kept me grounded. I've connected with my own culture. I've connected with my people. And it's not just, you said, talks about ethnicity, not just black people, but people that believe in dance and the power of dance and the power that, that dance can give you to recreate and find yourself as a person, as an individual, as a human being. And it's hard life being a dancer. It's physically hard. I think Abba Daly met, you know, talked about the sacrifices that you make. You don't make money. You have to do, have a day job. You have to do so many other things. But the essence of dance has stayed with me. And I'm, I feel I'm grateful to Bristol, actually. I'm grateful to ADAD for the work that they did. And when I discovered the exhibition of the history of black dance in Britain, I was just like, whoa, completely thrown away because I didn't know, it wasn't taught anywhere else. It wasn't taught on the dance course that both Keir and I went. They didn't mention any of these dancers. They, it was a complete surprise to me. So I feel really lucky to be in Bristol. And I hope that Bristol 
um, recognizes what it has and kind of continues to build on it and more dancers come move to Bristol and we have more dance venues that we have a proper dance school in Bristol so I'm just putting it out there so if anybody's thinking of relocating to Bristol as a dance <laughs> company please come you have dancers who are eager enthusiastic and they just can't wait that's it to say. fantastic anybody want to contribute yeah yes yeah Wait, I come with the microphone and the and the so I, I get the exact. I've, I've got quite a, a very Bristol specific question. Um, I'm a theatre maker from Bristol, so dance is always on the periphery of what I do. Um, but I'm just wondering what is the future of dance in Bristol? If there are any new spaces, venues, or things that are being established that we could use this moment to draw attention to? Like, I don't know what's going on with the, like the future, the funding of all these amazing mm. places like Trinity Centre, the Comic Centre. Mm. Are there, you know, I've, I've heard talk of a new venue being put together by impermanent dance and if that is mm. happening uh we just like as a bristol artist it'd be nice to know any insights that you've got about the future of dance in bristol and how it relates to all the other art forms i think the dance company you mentioned um is that the one maybe based at saint michael on the mount church yeah yeah i mean I haven't heard a lot of information. I did meet a couple of the founders a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not sure how accessible that'll be. <laughs> I'd like to think it would be accessible, but who knows? Um, I think maybe we have a lot of facilities actually across Bristol and there are quite a few institutions, I would say, whether it be private schools, um, maybe even the old Vic or Bristol University, you certainly do have resources in terms of spaces. Maybe there's a way that that could be utilized a bit more or, or kind of given in kind to some of these dancers and creatives, that would be really useful. Um, I should say that Kumba Center, when I used to do a regular community class, they used to give me the space off a very low cost. Um, otherwise, it, I would have really struggled to have, to have done what I was doing. So I'd like to shout them out. Um, I should also mention maybe decolonizing memory, digital bodies and movement, which is um, part of a strand of work that Bristol University is doing actually. And I'm an associate researcher on that. And I think park that side of it, actually what it's about is finding different techniques to create a new dance for Bristol. So this is kind of drawing on the tradition of having these folk dances um, of the African diaspora, but creating something that talks about now, but also references the past and talks about Bristol's history in that as well. And something that can is we're currently creating with, you know, um, anyone who wanted to sign up could sign up and come along to the to the monthly sessions. And we have a kind of midpoint catch up online and create from scratch something new. And I hope the, the aspiration for that is, again, something I'm really passionate about and always have been is the idea of mass dance of many people learning something coming together in that moment to perform a dance because I just kind of anticipate what energy could be created with that and it's something I'm more, always interested in so it's something that's inclusive and it's for Bristol and I would love to see more of that more kind of dances that people learn create together you learn you teach it to other people or we'll, we'll be developing an app where people can also learn this dance and we have different times of the year where we can come out together and we when we do this dance um, and I think that could be something interesting something slightly new and something important for Bristol and also underpinning all of that is the sense of healing that we hope can come from the fact that we've got different people coming together to talk about actually in some cases very um, sometimes difficult subjects actually but finding a way through dance to to kind of find our way through that together as a community of people from different backgrounds yeah that's great great that you mention and give more details about that project which uh, is uh, a great occasion indeed to 
to get together and meet each other there is a lot of uh, different uh, kind of uh, uh, backgrounds who, mm. who converge in it that's right and yeah. then rubber who's on the call just heard yeah. from was um, gave us yeah. a you know a master class sort of taster in our workshop yesterday mm. which was really incredible and really really important that we have someone like rubber who is kind of you know part of the institution of bristol in terms of traditional dance mm. And for me, um, also as a mother, as someone who really cares about my community, you know, it often takes me to tears when I think about where's our legacy. And so for me, it was so important to have someone like Rubber um, sharing with us and that we can actually fuse that element of tradition, all the knowledge that he has into this and that we actually cement this. And this is part of our archive. This is part of our culture. And if, if younger people and future generations can learn this dance, then, and our, then our work is done as artists. Dana, I'm thinking back about Jack's point. I, I wonder if you are also thinking of kind of, uh, I mean, you, you, I think you are concerned. Of course, I, I live with Jack, so I know <laughs> what you may be thinking of, I guess. But about uh, structures that would uh, kind of, uh, uh, I mean, how, how can we make, and it relates also, I suppose, to what uh, Ruba was saying, how, how, the, uh, how do we make sure that there are institutions that mm. kind of help us to... It's to... a shame we don't have any representation from Dance Futures. I mean, yeah, I know, just... you might know a bit more than I do. I fill out the loop. If I fill out of the loop, who else fills out of the loop? Mm. Who's a dance artist in Bristol? I think as, as challenging as it has been over the last couple of years with lockdown, we need to make sure that, you know, the rubbers, the, the tissues, everyone else is part of this and understands yeah. and knows what's going on. So, yeah, tonight is positive that we're having this conversation. Absolutely. And hopefully this is just a starting place to, I mean, not that uh, it's the first time, first start ever, but really, I mean, there is a kind of uh, a, a very fertile soil for uh, for getting this gathering ups and uh, and of course I mean we are sorry that we didn't have uh, Deborah with us but she was uh, the head of this uh, Bristol Dance Futures project that I think is about to finish and of course I suppose they haven't been that lucky because all of it happened during COVID but and they they put in place a lot of initiatives that of course you Jack know about with Laila Diallo and uh, Catherine Hall. So there are a lot of things, but uh, it would be great if we get more together, I mean, and kind of see where it goes. Because when you compare it to all the places in, uh, in England, although there is such a rich uh, soil, we don't really have a place for dance. We don't really have a... If you want to go and see dance, you would have to go to places that are host in dance. It's not mm. like... Uh, we are on the shadow of theater and of music, which of course are famous in Bristol, but there is, yeah, that reality. Yeah. I don't know um, the ins and outs, but it's interesting to think that Theatre Bristol is going through a Supreme Forming change. And I know that Theatre Bristol is really popular and quite popular. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we'll just read because I see the chat. There is uh, there is comments in the chat. And maybe we can go through them together. Uh, you want me to? Do you want yeah. me to read them or you're gonna read them? Yeah, merci. If you would like to, that would okay. Be um, I got one here uh, from Sally saying, great to hear all this and keen to hear more, especially if dancing heritage in, is in danger. And then Jane also said, Sally and Rabbi, it's a worry at how to safeguard traditions that uh, root people's lives, artists, even Ailey, I guess, are constrained by wider cultural values that work against important values. But if we don't act now, it's going to be hard to refine re them. And then I've also got Sally here, sounds like an interesting project. Thanks 
uh, Jane and everyone, um, you know, well, um, left us uh, Twitter details. So if you want to continue um, chatting on that, um, it would be quite nice looking for things to link via Dancing Heritage. And um, I did want to actually, before I, I, I kind of get anybody to um, comment on all these all the, the, the things that are in the chat, I also wanted to say something about what Cleo was talking about and, and in some ways everybody um, and Rachel, um, this idea of um, having things locally, what can you do for Bristol? And there's this idea of global, basically doing things locally, but global actually. Um, this is something that can be thought about. And I was, you know, as Claire was talking about what we could do in Bristol, there's so many ways, uh, maybe one of the things forward is reviving the forms by linking up um, uh, with, with, you know, cross art forms, basically the model of cross arts, because now film is reviving Ailey's choreography. Yes, it's a big organization, but I'm thinking in terms of why couldn't we get with other institutions and other bigger um, uh, people who can do things um, to, to work together, to work in collaboration and actually start naming those names like the, you know, like the poetry where you were naming all those names and uh, bringing them to the open and, um, you know, just continuing creating those safe spaces, having these moments of pause, but actually very meaningful conversations. So these are some of the things that are coming through into my head and thinking, mm, there's a point here because, you know, you can work with galleries, you can work with museums. And I think, you know, what you're talking about, Dance Futures, I think is also one of those things that you're talking about. But um, yeah, maybe we could start doing small steps, but meaningful steps, small but meaningful or bits. We will definitely go on with the conversation in person with our wine uh, and uh, Sorry, we can keep online. my laptop on for, for, um, for online uh, chats but I, I suppose we can, we can maybe go. We lost a lot of people because we've been stretching in terms of time a lot. And um, yeah, Christiana also was there. And uh, I wonder, Christiana, if you want to add anything, just also to say hello. It's, I'm very happy that uh, she made it. So no, she can't. But uh, OK, thank you for joining. And uh, she's joining from Bologna, uh, where she's teaching African dances. Mm. And um, yeah. Hopefully she'll visit uh, sometimes. And um, yeah, I wonder if Mercy, you want to add anything? No, actually, I don't have anything to add at the moment because I just thought of, you know, these are some of the things that I was thinking about. Um, who are the people who are going to drive this forward in Bristol? Um, that's what I'm thinking because I know that as I was a director of ADAD we had a programmer in Bristol Katie and we connected that way but of course um, ADAD is, 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 is in One Dance UK at the moment so it's, it's kind of difficult to know how to to pull out things I mean people like rubber people like Cleo you're doing a great project is there a way that we can revive those forms through the dance forms i'm uh, sorry just through the through the art form that you're using even if it's not entirely dance but it's memory yeah i mean we're hoping as well i've, I've sort of spoken to rubber about trying to do documentary on rubber and the drummers that he's worked with since the 70s just so we can archive mm. um yeah and just to say as well a bit of a plug i'm back here at the cube on the 14th of mm, March, mm. Um, with a few picked film screenings, short films about dance, and oh. it's called Movement in the Movement. So, yeah, please do come along. Oh, fantastic. I wish I was there. 
Uh, Charlotte here is saying if the UK was signed up to the Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage, it might help to give visibility to dancing heritage. Mm. That's another one. So mm. it'd be nice to follow up on these things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The Heritage Lottery Fund will support dance as well. Yeah. So, so in, indeed, uh, thank you so much, Charlotte and Jane from the Society of, uh, for Dance Research who also joined us. And uh, also another thing to mention is how the connection with Mercy, between me and Mercy came uh, about. Uh, we organized a symposium uh, in November, which was also an hybrid symposium on uh, the themes of inclusion and intersectionality in dance. And uh, while organizing that and trying to bring all different uh, forms of intersections, uh, Jane introduced us to Mercy and then she became a, a very, she, she chaired the session, she hosted another one and she became very inspiring reference. Uh, and uh, uh, so there is this collaboration with uh, Kauma Arts that uh, the Society for Dance Research is keeping on. Yeah. And this, the, the, that conference is, uh, there is a lot of material that you can still access. We can send you the links on a repository of material that was collected. Plus we are working on it further. We are trying to make a podcast out of those conversations. So more, uh, more material to support and uh, reference. Yeah. I think there's also um, a project that uh, Rubber is involved in as well, the Roots 40 with Judith Palmer. So that's also something that's linked to dance and music and it might just be an interesting thing to continue, maybe to promote and push, you know, for people to know about, raise awareness of it. Um, I don't know whether you want to say something about it, Rubber. Yes. Um... Yes, thank you for those conversations I just heard. Yeah, it's, it's good to kind of like try and find some way forward. And I think, yeah, the aim should be totally an institute, yeah, totally dedicated. You have an institute for Asian Indian dance, you have an institute. So that will be the, the end goal for whatever collaborations um, we may um, be able to, to, to gather together. Yeah, it does take uh, people from higher standing though to influence us. For example, I can think of name Major, Major uh, Mayor Marvin May, Marvin Reese. Yeah, um, being the first black mayor in Europe in Bristol here, Bristol's mm -hmm. quite really interesting. Even I got started from Bristol with my friend June Gamble, mm -hmm. and it was June Gamble who inspired me to start Happy Dance. This is my company. Yeah. So everybody forget about June Gamble, but she's the originator for a dad. So Bristol's got a lot to offer. Now, that is why Roots 40 is around. Judith herself done this because of the same problem. There are many artists, well, as I say, it, it, it sounds uh, contradictory because I said like there's only a few skilled artists able to kind of like pass on this knowledge but still there's a well of artists yeah and other artists that has influenced traditional dance and they've never been mentioned some of them have passed on now and they've done great works and so her idea was to kind of like create an, an award scheme uh to rec to bring recognition to these artists yeah and allowing them to kind of like express themselves on a bigger platform you see, so that's why I really um, took to what um, Khabibi Judith was, was saying, because it's part of, 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 of my vision, yeah. And I think, yeah, it is difficult to get this on the way. It's been going on for a while, but we have not given up. Yeah, and we, she's interviewed quite a few artists. And I think, yeah, it's something to do with all the heritage as well of the form, yeah, is involved. So it's a very positive form because it's a step forward to what I've been looking for, yeah. Um, because um, I did say the word earlier on, it's like a form an art form in some aspect, but these, these artists are really out there doing it from the love, just pure love. 
and 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 there's not no real security yeah and also there's there's so the it it, 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 it does just needs kind of like um create something that that can be more like to the form itself and to the individuals and organizations that are, are really working hard behind the scenes. Yeah, and so I commend Judith for Ruth 40, which um, um, I believe is a real positive step forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, I wanted to man maybe uh... Uh, Ruba, you are giving classes. Maybe it's a good time to also, maybe people wouldn't know. I didn't know. You told me yesterday that you are going, you are running classes on Wednesdays. Yes, I am. And and I really like your dancing. You're a good dancer. And as I saw you, I said, I need that money in my class. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. for all the people to know that this is uh, yeah. getting in but touch. But yes, the class is every Wednesday. Now, this has been joint, really, because I have my, um, what do you call it, freelance company, Happy Dance, but I'm also part of DMAT UK. And um, even though we've lost the studio, we're still uh, providing opportunities for individuals and for the dance to flourish. So at the moment, it's been about... Um, plan for funding, something that I don't really like depending on too much, because in my experience, the funding has taken us to a particular level and then they get cut. And so the form don't get to progress. That's something that happened in, with ECOME. ECOME Arts were the pioneer group that um, allowed African dance to be what it is today, even the Jido. The Jido followed ECOME. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah. Um, it's important that we, oh, yeah, I'm losing it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But yeah, the fact is, yeah. Um, yeah. So Wednesdays now, the reason why I do these classes, yeah, we offer them free. Ah, even free. We do them free. People come free for the, yeah, that's what the funding is all about is to do with bringing people back from the COVID misery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bringing school children back, bringing the community back. And the only way yeah, everybody's been hit hard, really, yeah, even, even ourselves being hit hard, we're still, you know, um, functioning. So it's to kind of like bring people back um, on a regular basis. As many reasons why I do that class, um, as um, I, um, the actual holistic element of it is not just about fitness, um, and, and it's the shared community everybody enjoys. And it's a, it's a room where, when you are sound, surrounded by live drumming, there's nothing more like it. Yeah, because obviously the, 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 the music and the way it flows through the body is quite different. Yeah, quite different, I can say. So we have that Wednesday on uh, six o'clock. Yeah, we have beginners. And, and, and then after that, we have more intermediates. I never really have an advanced advanced class yet because there's not enough advanced dancers to kind of like bring forward, you see? So I draw a cue from the intermediate class and I kind of like support them in their thing. And now people like Kenzie are now teaching their own dances and, and et cetera. We've supported most of the artists that's been mentioned by uh, Cleo Batch, Batch Guinea and, and, and all these. So it's about yeah, maintaining this hub because Bristol is unique and it's maintaining this hub of artists, yeah, yeah, that brings this cultural light to the city. Yeah, there's not many other cities that has that type of, um, lucky enough to have this group of type of artists, yeah, yeah in one pocket, you see. So yeah, that's Wednesday. And it's, it's also to, 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 um, to make people aware of the techniques that I was talking about. So um that i feel i have kind of like um 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 i just say uh i would say created but um i've come across um how to um um um, um teach in the technical form basically um fridays we have drumming workshop just started as well same process free for the first six weeks to encourage people to come you find after six weeks they want to stay because they never know that it was like this before. You see, 
So, um, and the brainwave for me is like on Wednesdays, we do the dance. On Fridays, we teach the drumming for that dance, you see? So people get a fullness of the, of the form, yes? Um, um, and no one can explain to you the beauty of live drumming. Yeah, yeah, um, um, no one can explain. I've heard someone mention earlier on, which is dance is really great. It can transport to different areas, different, you know, you can get possessed. But to know that the Africans actually have a technique that kind of like just do it like that through a sound of music, automatically transfers, transfers you. Yeah, and the way they just put it across is absolutely mind blowing. And I'm challenge anyone that will ever come to the experience or uh, get to study this, and it will enhance whatever you do. Yes. So this is what my um, um, kind of mission here is in Bristol. Also, obviously, I'm applying for fundings because um, I want to get to the schools. Yeah. Uh, again, I've done. Um, I'm not that. I'm not that. Say. I have achieved some great milestones. You know, I've, 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 I've taught on the South Bank. I've set up projects on the South Bank, Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, whole day projects. Yeah, get where to pay for that one. And, and, and um, a, another, could I share this with you? Have you got time? Um, another, another really pressing point for me has been the education of children. And in all my years and going to schools up and down the country, Scotland, Wales, especially around the place they call Black History Month, yeah, I've always noticed, I've always noticed that up and down the country, it was just a small pocket of Black heroes that were being celebrated. And no one really knew about the deepness of the influence that Africa has had on the whole of our lives, everyone in this, in this room here, yeah. Yeah, I actually go to school and tell everybody that they're Africans. Yeah, they can't believe it. So I say, go and trace your DNA, things like that. Yes. So, the, the, so I, I applied to Arts Council and I was funded for two years. Yeah, very well funded um, with support from Bristol City Council as well, two years to bring this project to school. What made it different was that I wanted to kind of like bring education and, re and research in the classroom alongside the dance that they're studying. This went very well. The Arts Council loved it and they refunded me again for the next year. So in total, I got quite a bit of money for that, mm -hmm. which I distributed. Now I applied just for the, for, the, for the project in school, but because I had this funding, I decided I'm going to use it to train dancers as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to also use it to create an online um, resource page, which is called mama-africa.net. And I spent the last couple of years with my colleagues, of course, through DMA can help because no one can do it on your own. <laughs> yeah. And we've come up with a really beautiful page. And this was to help teachers who are not trained in passing on this information about Africa especially around Black History Month, help them to find subjects that are deeper, yeah, and more meaningful and give more understanding to the pupils and make them feel proud to be who they are, yeah. So it was many, you know, it had many aspects to it. It brings confidence to them. Yeah. Oh my, I'm very um, sorry. I, I have to... Uh, sorry, I knew I was going to go on too long. All right. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but Thank you very you much, see, though, for all the info. And all right, I'll cut right it, now. It, but it, you get an idea? Yeah. 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 So this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes I don't stop. Sorry, I will carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Esther, before uh, Rachel, I wanted to ask you as well if you want to update on the Sambistas and if people can reach and uh, join. And... Okay, so African Sambistas um, was basically to remind people where samba came from because it's imagined it just, it just happened in brazil but the roots go deep into africa and so i started african sambistas 13 years ago 
my class isn't still running. I'm not actually teaching them anymore because I've trained my dancers and they teach the classes. And unfortunately, it's also on a Wednesday, rubber, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> at Glenfrew School. So they do it. There's a drumming class. The drummers are amazing. Uh, big drums, beautiful. And do a beginner's drumming and then a, da a drumming for performance and then a dance class. So I have three classes back to back. We do festivals, although we haven't had any festivals for the last two years, sadly, but the likes of Shambhala and Womad, we've done some St. Paul's Carnival and love the mass dance. So lots of people dancing together for me, a bit like Leo, is a joy. So if you have free time on a Wednesday, you can hop between the two classes. <laughs> And there is a website, so feel free. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to thank uh, the Society for Dance Research to, for allowing us to do this and uh, do this experiment and uh, bring the Choreographic Forum to host uh, uh, a film and to have a digital format. And, uh, and uh, thank you so much for the confidence that you Thank gave you. and the same also for the cube uh because uh this is a great uh, reality we have and uh, the cube is what you make right so thank you especially to rodri otherwise without uh, whom we wouldn't be here and um and uh, thank you merci for uh, i really enjoyed to to organize this together with you um I'm very, thank you very much for, for uh, Cleo and Rachel to join us online, Ruba there, and uh, all the people who contributed to the conversation in the previous session as well, Adeshola and uh, Thomas. And uh, uh, I mentioned that we have a little refreshment now with something to drink and some uh, pizza, party pizza uh, made by Cibomatto Bristol and some mm. delicious chocolate made by Vicolo Six. Ah. Yeah, and uh, lucky us. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's bi local businesses that also have to be supported. Yes. And... Um, I don't know. I think that's all. I just want to add one more. Uh, if you can let me. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, uh, acknowledge Michaela at Dark Matter mm. because she's the one that con contacted me and asked me to um, support them in creating a buzz around the film, Ailey. And because of that, she let us be as creative as we wanted. And uh, now this is a ripple effect and I'm just excited to see what is coming out of a conversation that started by just thinking that it's going to be one moment, but it's, you know, many moments are happening. And I hope that this is what we can recreate as black dance in terms of bringing people together and creating mini events that become a bigger whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.